All right, I have another cute mug to share with you and the coffee that's in it is for a really good cause and might even be a good gift idea for you. And we're gonna cover the third throne name of Jesus, Everlasting Father. So we'll talk about that today. All right, I've kind of gotten into sharing these little, well, first, these dollar store mugs I think are just adorable. So this one today says, I'm only a morning person on December 25th. <laughs> uh, the fact is that I am a mother of two small children, so I am always a morning person, especially on December 25th, but I just thought that was so cute. And the coffee that I brewed up today, so I got out the French press, that was mostly for you, but it was just another way to brew a special drink as we dig into our Bible study. This coffee today is from Hope Coffee, and I wanted to share that with you because they're doing amazing work working with the farmers directly in Mexico and Honduras. So they make sure that they're getting a good fair wage for their labor, but then they're also working with the local churches to help meet the needs of the people. So the, they work with the churches and then the churches help to provide especially clean water and safe living situations. So there are some amazing testimonies on their website. And I think not only is this actually a pretty good cup of coffee, but it might be a good gift idea if you're looking for someone who would appreciate something that is also, I mean, good, but for a good cause. And so they have some little gift ideas and it ships in three to five days. So we're, uh, we're not too late. You still have some time. So that might be a fun last minute gift idea. Also, I wanted to invite you to do a study with us in the new year. Now, this isn't my study but it's still going to be good. I know it. This is from Proverbs 31 Ministries, and they do this really wonderful thing where you get, you can buy this awesome study guide, and then you can follow along with the online Bible study. So this one is for five weeks starting in the new year, and it's seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. He's never absent. We're never alone. I love uncovering all of the ways that Jesus was right there in the Old Testament. And so what we're going to do is follow along with this study if you want to join in and kind of journey through this together. So I'll still be doing stuff here and we'll um, have these times together, but I just thought this was too good to pass up and I thought it might be fun for us to do together in the new year. I know who's thinking about the new year right now. The only reason I bring it up is if you do want to go ahead and order your study guide so that it's ready when you're ready to think about the new year. Just like tuck it away. Maybe put a reminder where you put it. Um, this is a fact. I actually just spent 10 minutes looking for this mug before I found it in the front hall closet. So sometimes I put things away so that they're safe, but then I have no idea where they are. I'm sure that doesn't happen to you. Anyway, if you tuck this away and you need to make a note or reminder for yourself, um, you can do that. <laughs> but I wanna invite you to join along and maybe we'll do like a live or two and just have some ways to interact around the content, which I think would be really fun. So I know I can't believe we're thinking about the new year when it's still just Christmas time and Christmas I love and I love what we're doing digging into the throne names of Jesus. So we've been reading from Isaiah 9, actually just a tiny little snippet where it's prophesying about who this savior is going to be. And again, you know, the people in Isaiah's time wouldn't have necessarily understood who this Messiah was going to be and how God was going to come to them. And so this is the passage that we've been anchored in Isaiah nine, starting in verse six, it says, for to us, a child is born to us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace. Now, the last two weeks, if you want to go back and look at them, it might be helpful, or you can just jump in today. We talked about what it meant to be wonderful counselor. Now, the name wonderful means something that is extraordinary, marvelous. It implies something that is outside of natural limitations or that's supernatural. And counselor is one who knows what to do or how to plan. So a wonderful counselor is one who can supernaturally lead you in what to do and in planning. How amazing is that to have the Lord of the universe come to us as a baby and as our savior and one who is always with us now through the Holy Spirit, be a wonderful counselor. And then from there last week, we went to 
mighty God. And we talked about that mighty has the implication of like a military ruler, which means he's one who commands armies in victory. So again, whether it's physical protection or if it's provision, we have a mighty God who is our savior and our father in heaven. And so then today we're going to talk about everlasting father. Now, everlasting father is literally father of perpetuity. That is one who will be perpetually the father. And in Canaanite religion, so pagan religion surrounding the Israelite people, the high God is called the father of years. And this title in Hebrew, everlasting father, seems to carry a similar force. But by taking this title, everlasting father, the Messiah is to be known as the one who is the sovereign Lord over the ever-changing years. He produces and directs all of eternity. Now, a slight semantic here is eternal implies that there is no beginning and there is no end, which is true of God. Everlasting implies that he is going to continue on and on and on. And so when Isaiah is saying, this is your father, he is going to continue on and on and on, people would come to understand that much like what a father of a nation would be. A father of a nation was one who took the role and then over his tenure, he would make sure that he was providing for the people, he was protecting them. This is what King Ahaz was trying to do, not in the right way, but the picture we have here is one who takes on the role, Jesus would come and take on flesh while remaining deity, and he would continue on as father. Now the great part about him being everlasting is he will never pass away, he will never change, and he will be our father perpetually. So by taking the title Everlasting Father, the Messiah is to be known as the one who is the sovereign Lord over the ever-changing years. He is the one who produces and directs eternity. When I hear that, something in my heart settles in. It's actually the same thing I experience when I sit next to my dad. I have one of those great dads who came to all of our soccer games, even though he was working full-time and farming full-time. He made such a special effort to always be there. He, we would sit with him in his chair, and even though he would get in late at night, again, because he was working so much, he always gave us his attention. He would lay on the floor and play with us. He would take us out in the tractor with us. He would let us drive the tractor when we were way too young. <laughs> but if you have a figure in your life like that, you know what it means to feel their presence. And even if you don't have a natural father figure like that in your life, you can feel the weight of that when it says he produces and directs eternity. This is a good father who is so big and he can handle anything that we're experiencing right now. Such a name here clearly belongs to a God, not just any divine creature or spiritual being, but to the one and only God. And by describing God as father, he is expressing a new nature for God, one who is near, who nurtures, and who provides. Now, this nature, again, might be tricky for some people to relate to, especially if there wasn't a natural father figure like that. In fact, I was reading this study by Baylor University, and it was done in conjunction with Gallup, and it asked people what view they hold of God. And so these were the four highest ranked views and it's a little troubling, I'm gonna warn you. 31% believe in an authoritarian God, a God who is angry at humanity's sin. Now don't get me wrong, there is a judgment side of God, but that is a contradiction with, of who he is as loving father, or if we're, not, if we're seeing him only as authoritative and not first as loving father. 24% believe in a distant God who is more of a cosmic force that launched the world and left it spinning on its own. And I know a lot of people can relate to that. He's out there. He put all this emotion and now he's just standing back and kind of watching it happen. 16% believe in a critical God, which I kind of lump in with the authoritarian God, one who is judgment-eyed on the world, but he's not going to intervene either to punish or to comfort. 23% believe in a benevolent God, one who is forgiving and accepting of anyone who repents. 
And that's, we need to be in that 23% of the population. And again, I understand that it might be difficult. Sometimes we hold beliefs that we don't even really fully recognize. You know, maybe I never would have thought that I viewed God as distant until now it's being explained like that. And it's like, oh yeah, I mean, I can't feel him. I can't see him. So he does feel distant or, you know, critical. And again, if that's been modeled to us, someone who's critical in our lives, it's like, well, yeah, God's like that. He's just waiting for me to mess up. And so the invitation here today is to receive our father afresh, receive Jesus in the manger and understand that he is coming to be our everlasting father. And it's okay right now if our understanding of who he is as such is small like a baby. If our faith is only to receive him right now as an infant, but then to trust through the power of the Holy Spirit that our understanding and our place for him in our heart can continue to grow. This is a little story that William Barclay shares. It's of a young boy who was seated next to his dad in worship, and he was doing everything he could to stay awake. As he was nodding off out of the corner of his eye, he saw his father abruptly raise his arm. He thought, oh no, and he braced himself. But then his father put his arm around him and pulled him close. He looked down and winked at him. The boy said, I see my father in a different light after that day, and I want to sleep in his arms. I think that's a beautiful picture of sometimes we brace, sometimes we expect something different, but hopefully when we look, we only see love and acceptance in his eyes. I honestly believe that that is who Jesus came to be for us, and that is the invitation today. If you have never made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, this is an amazing opportunity. All you have to do is repent. Say, I'm sorry. I know I've sinned. I know I've come up short, but I want today from this moment on to be different. I want an everlasting father in my life. I need a wonderful counselor and I want you to be my mighty God. So if you make that decision, I would love for you to share that in the comments. We're going to continue to interact here and I hope everyone else continues to pray for those who are seeing this and who are taking this opportunity. And again, for each of us, to receive this revelation anew, that he is so near, he is so good, and his gift at Christmas is the salvation that ushers us in to eternity with him. So Father, I thank you. I thank you for this revelation of who you are as everlasting God, a father of perpetuity, of the one who directs time and all of eternity. Lord, you are so big and you are so majestic but you are so good and you are so near. So Father, I pray right now that we would receive that revelation afresh. We would see receive your love afresh. And Father, that this Christmas, Lord, that we would emerge on the other side of this season, new, refreshed, faith-filled, and ready to serve you in the new year. So Father, I just thank you for this time. I bless anyone who just accepted you as Savior. Father, I pray that you would bring along others who will help to disciple them, guide them. Lord, give them an amazing church home and pastors who can help to care for them and friends and neighbors who can walk with them on this amazing journey. And of course, we'll continue to spend this time together as well. So I bless each one of us now in Jesus' name, amen.